Good day, I'm Kerry Dillinger. This is Bible Class Topics, and you've tuned in to another lesson in our five-part series. As a matter of fact, it is the fifth lesson, fifth and final lesson in our five-part series. This one is entitled, Attitudes to Develop. You can't keep your attitude a secret. The church needs to be moving forward. Let's read Philippians 3, 12 through 14. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. As individuals and collectively as the Lord's Church, we must always be looking forward, thinking forward, and planning forward. If you missed any of the previous lessons, first we talked about challenges to accept, making a difference, evangelizing our community, developing church leaders and following God's word. Then we talked about enemies to defeat, ignorance, unbelief, apathy, and sin. We talked about dangers to avoid, false doctrine, division in the church, extremism, and overreaction. We talked about opportunities to take, realizing that opportunities exist right in front of our very eyes every day. If you missed any of these lessons, I will put a link to them in the order that they appeared on the channel in the description below. The last thing to consider as we move forward into the future is necessary attitudes to develop. Someone wrote this verse. It's called Advance Man. Its roots are inward, but its fruit is outward. It is our best friend or our worst enemy. It is more honest and more consistent than our words. It is an outward look based on past experiences. It is a thing that draws people to us or repels them. It's never content until it is expressed. It is the librarian of our past. It is the speaker of our present. It is the prophet of our future. What is it? It's our attitude. In this lesson, we want to share some biblical truths about the importance of attitude and how it can help us to accomplish God's will. In this lesson, we'll talk about and try to answer the questions, what is an attitude and why is it so important? What does the Bible say about attitudes and attitudes which positively affect the future of the Lord's Church. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, what is an attitude and why is it so important? If we define an attitude, we understand that it's a person's prevailing tendency to respond favorably or unfavorably to an object, a person, a group, or an event. Normally, we either speak of a positive attitude or a negative attitude. Practically, it is how we think about things or how we feel about things. Attitudes are formed by what we believe to be true about things. We can express our attitudes in several ways, in our facial expressions, in our tone of voice or the inflection of our words, in our behavior or in our lack of behavior, in the way we perform a task, in the energy we put into whatever we're doing, in the interest we have in a person, in a thing, or in an activity. Before we get too far into our lesson, let's have a few thoughts about the importance of attitudes, and we'll start with this quote. The late General Douglas MacArthur wrote something very profound on his 75th birthday. In the central place of every heart there is a recording chamber. So long as it receives messages of beauty, hope, cheer, and courage, 
so long are you young. When the wires are all down and your heart is covered with the snows of pes- pes- pessimism, pardon me, pessimism, and the ice of cynicism, then and only then are you grown old. Let me read that sentence again. When the wires are all down and your heart is covered with the snows of pessimism and the ice of cynicism, then and then only are you grown old. Wouldn't you hate to wear glasses all the time? Ask a small boy of his playmate. No, the other boy answered slowly. Not if I had the kind my grandma wears. She sees how to fix a lot of things, and she sees lots of nice things to do on a rainy day. She sees when folks are tired and sorry, and what will make them feel better, and she always sees what you meant to do even if you haven't got things just right. I asked her one day how she could see that way all the time, and she said it was the way she learned to look at things as she grew older. So it must be her glasses, right? Two frogs fell into a can of cream. The sides of the can were shiny and steep, and the cream was deep and cold. What's the use, said the first frog. Tis fate. No helps around. Goodbye, my friend. Goodbye, sad world, and weeping still he drowned. But the second was made of sterner stuff. He dog paddled in surprise, and while he wiped his creamy face and dried his creamy eyes, he said, I'll swim a while at least. It wouldn't really help the world if one more frog was dead. An hour or more he kicked and swam. Not once he stopped to mutter, but kicked and swam and swam and kicked, then hopped out of the butter. Stories like these and quotes like the one from Douglas MacArthur make us understand the power of attitude is seen in the fact that since it reflects what we believe, it reflects what we are. It reflects what we do. It reflects what we're willing to sacrifice and how hard we're willing to work and how much of ourselves we're willing to give to anything. There is no doubting that attitude determines success. It's as true of the work of the church as it is with anything else. What does the Bible have to say about attitudes? Well, first, the English translations of the Bible use the word attitude to translate words that might also be translated mind, countenance, or heart. Translators use the word attitude because it accurately reflects the meaning of the passage. Attitude is a very descriptive word that gives insight into how a person thinks or feels about something or someone. If you have your Bibles ready, we're going to take a quick look at these verses with little commentary on my part. Genesis 31, 2, And Jacob saw the attitude of Laban, and behold, it was not friendly towards him as formerly. That's from the New American Standard Version. Philippians 2.5, have this attitude in yourselves which was also in Christ. Also the New American Standard Version. 1 Kings 11.11 from the NIV, so Jehovah said to Solomon, since this is your attitude and you have not kept my covenant and my decrees which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your subordinates. Also from the NIV, Ezra 6.22, For seven days they celebrated with joy the Feast of Unleavened Bread because Jehovah had filled them with joy by changing the attitude of the king of Syria so that he assisted them in the work on the house of God, the God of Israel. Also from the NIV, Daniel 3.19, the Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual. Also from the NIV, Ephesians 4, 22 and 23, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds. The NAS says spirit of your mind. 
First Peter 4 1 and this one is also from the NIV therefore since Christ suffered in his body arm yourselves also with the same attitude because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin it's obvious that God's Word recognizes the importance of attitude and either commends or condemns people for the product of attitude in their lives. And now we want to talk about attitudes which positively affect the future of the Lord's Church. And we'll start with an obvious one. The congregation and the individuals in the congregation need a positive attitude toward God. The Hebrew writer said this in chapter 11, verse 6, And without faith it's impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Jesus said in John 14, 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And Paul told his Roman readers in chapter 2, verse 4, Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience? not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you unto repentance. A positive attitude towards God will make a difference in how interested you are in God. It will shape your willingness to seek for spiritual growth. It will determine the moral climate you decide to live in. The next attitude that positively will affect the church is... A positive attitude toward the church. In Acts 20, 28, as Paul was instructing the Ephesian elders, he told them, Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. It's important. The church is important. We have to have a positive attitude toward it. In Romans 14, 15, and then I'll skip to verse 20, Paul said, For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. And of course, Paul is writing to people who had religious beliefs from prior religions in which they ate or didn't eat certain things. Well, how does this reflect on the positive attitude toward the church? It reflects in this way. We are not in the church alone. We are in the church with all other believers. And locally, we are in a local congregation, and we need to do everything we can do with a positive attitude not to cause anyone in our local congregation to stumble. If we have the right attitude about the church, then we will want to share it with others. And this involves several different things. First, as we've already mentioned, as we discussed Romans 14, we have to love the people in the church. 1 Corinthians 12, 25, and 26, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, we all rejoice together. The Apostle John said this in his first letter, chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Another way we can portray, or portray, show, have a positive attitude toward the church is actively supporting the work of the church. 2 Corinthians 8, 8. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love is genuine. Paul was concerned that the church at Corinth was not loving each other. Have you read the first letter to Corinthians, to the Corinthians? Look at chapter 13. The importance of love 
the agape kind of love where you look out for the best interests of others. We can do this by supporting the work of the local church. Later on in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 12 and 13, for the ministry of this service is not only supporting the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your com- contribution for them all and for all others. In 2 Corinthians, Paul was convincing that church that they needed to get involved in helping the poor saints in Judea. And this was his answer to those that might not want to be involved in that support of that work. We have a full playlist on Paul's letter to the Corinthians, both the first letter and also the second letter. Please go to the home channel, the, the channel, uh, the home page of the channel, I should say, and find those playlists if you're interested in studying those letters with me. Besides loving the people in the church and actively supporting the work of the church, another way to show the positive attitude toward the church is your level of involvement with the church. Ephesians 4, 11 and through 16 he, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Your level of involvement in the church shows a positive attitude toward the church. Obviously, Paul wrote the letter to the Ephesians, to the church that met in Ephesus, and he encouraged them to take advantage of every opportunity to equip the saints, to be builded up with one another, and to attain the unity of faith and the knowledge of God's Son. Another attitude that positively affects the church is a positive attitude toward the assemblies of the church. 1 Corinthians 11, 22, what? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? At this point, some of the Corinthians were ruining the Lord's Supper by making it into a full-blown meal. He says, you have houses to eat and drink in, or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those that have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. The assembly of the church is important, and how the church assembles is important. Your attendance, of course, will answer how important you think the assemblies are. It will show your attitude. The Hebrew writer said this in chapter 10, 25, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as, as you see the day drawing near. Wait a minute, am I saying that the assembly and the fact that you neglect the assembly is not just on your shoulders? No, it isn't, because the reason we assemble in the first place is so we can encourage one another. It's not all about me. It's not all about you. It is all about us and how we meet together to show that we are indeed the children of of God. Are we willing to bring visitors to the assemblies? In 1 Corinthians 14, 24, and 25, he had to get on to the church there because they were misusing their spiritual gifts. But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or outsider enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed. 
and so falling on his face he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. We need to be reading the Bible at our assemblies and when we bring visitors to our assemblies they need to be hearing the Bible written so that it can get into their hearts and convict them that they need to be followers of Christ. Are we participating in the worship? Are we doing what we can do? Are we praying with those leading the prayer? Are we singing the songs that are being led in our presence? Are we communing with our brethren and Christ as we partake of the Lord's Supper? Are we listening thoughtfully to the sermon of the hour? Are we making notes? Are we checking up on the preacher to make sure that he is properly applying scripture? I hope you're checking up on me here on the channel. I'm not perfect. If I'm misinterpreting scripture here, I need to know about it. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 14, 14 through 19. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you're saying? For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a foreign tongue. In Romans 1, verses 9 and 10, Paul said, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. And in John 4, 24, So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. If Jesus would not come to them, if Jesus would not stay with them, where did they go? They went and assembled where Jesus was. What about a positive attitude about being different from the world. John 17, 15, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Jesus, of course, in his massive prayer of John 17, where he prays for the apostles, the disciples, and he prays for every believer. I do not ask that you take them out of the world. We are going to be in the world, but we can't be of the world. This is the difference between leading others to Christ and being led by others away from Christ. James had to get harsh with his readers in James 4.4. 4, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. We have to lift up our heads and we have to know that we are children of the King. In Galatians 3, 26 and 27, Paul said, For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Have we put on Christ? Individually, we each need to come to this decision, the decision that we need to be baptized for remission of our sins so that we can show that we are indeed as a as a person different from the world and as a collective congregation of God's people that we are in the world but we are not of the world. The final attitude that we want to talk about in this lesson is a positive attitude toward life in general. The Apostle Peter said this in 2 Peter 1.3, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. Meanwhile, in 
in one of his last letters, Paul wrote to Timothy, 1 Timothy 4, 8, For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. This, then, is the difference between overcoming the problems of life and being overcome by the problems of life. In Romans 8, verses 33 through 39, Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword, as it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hebrews 12, 11, For the moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. In our last scripture of of the lesson, today is 1 Corinthians 10 13 no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability but with the temptation he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it do you see life as your opportunity to learn how to be a servant of God Well, you can't keep your attitude a secret. You're going to show it in your face. You're going to, we're going to hear it in your voice and we're going to see it in your actions. However much you are for or against something is going to show through to others. If the church moves forward, then every member of every local congregation needs to have a good attitude. None of us want to be the weak link. We all need to work to the best of our abilities and have a good attitude about God, about the local church and its assemblies. We have to have a good attitude about how we can live in the world but not be of the world and how we can lead a positive Christian life for all the world to see. Thanks to Jeff Asher for supplying these outlines that we've been using over the last few weeks. They can be found at expositorysermonoutlines.com. Also, our Words as Pictures photo, Stay Positive, was provided by Words as Pictures over at stocksnap.com. Thank you for watching. Thank you for studying with me. If you have made it through all of these lessons in this series, then you indeed are a supporter of this channel, and it's greatly appreciated. Your continued support would be also greatly, greatly appreciated. Thank you for studying with me. Let's pray for each other. Let's pray for the world. We'll see you soon here on the channel, Lord willing. And until then, may God bless.